You need to speak into the mic. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Daniel Mann Literary Luminaries Lecture, organized by the Library Congregate Committee of Congregation Bethel and co-sponsored by the Men's Club and Women of Bethel. Uh, I'm Jonathan Levy, part of the Library Committee. We're very excited to be here in person and look forward to the day when everyone feels comfortable joining together in the shul. In the meantime, this event is being live streamed. We're pleased to have Dr. Miriam Isaacs to address us today on the subject of the Ben Stonehill Song Archive. I'll introduce her and the topic of her presentation in just a moment, but first, I'd like to remind you of a few logistical details and provide brief background <clears throat> on the lecture series. Dr. Isaacs will speak for about 40 minutes, and there'll be about 20 minutes of Q&A. We're recording the lecture, but we won't record the Q&A session. Please keep your questions brief. I and your fellow audience members will appreciate questioners' restraint. In order to make sure that everyone hears the questions, it may be necessary for me or our speaker to repeat them. The Literary Luminaries Lecture began more than 10 years ago, organized by the late Daniel Mann of blessed memory. He conceived of the lectures as a vehicle for speakers who've enhanced Jewish literary culture in the Washington area. We've interpreted the term culture broadly. Past speakers have included scholars such as Peggy Perlstein, then head of the Hebraic section of the Library of Congress, the founders of Carbon Publishing, the then editors of the Washington Jewish Week, and cookbook author and Jewish food scholar, Joan Nathan. More recently, we've turned to local universities for our speakers. Last year, <clears throat> yeah, last year we had the pleasure of hosting Professor Daniel Schwartz of George Washington University discussing how the ghetto became black based on his recent book. <clears throat> and the year before that, um, we had someone from the same university that uh, Dr. Isaacs was associated with, the University of Maryland, Professor Adi Mahalel, discussing the role of the Jewish tavern in the works of Sholem Aleichem. So today we're renewing our series association with the University of Maryland as we welcome Dr. Miriam Isaacs, who spent 16 years on the faculty at College Park teaching Yiddish language and culture. Dr. Isaacs is a native Yiddish speaker, having been born in a displaced persons camp in Germany. She earned a PhD in linguistics from Cornell University. I don't really feel the need to defend the choice of a lecture on songs in a literary lecture series, certainly not since Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Dr. Isaacs will speak on the Ben Stonehill Song Archive, a trove of more than a thousand Yiddish songs recorded in 1948 by an amateur musicologist. The singers were Holocaust survivors temporarily residing in New York after arriving in the United States. As Dr. Isaacs described them, the songs constitute a haunting testimony to survivors' resilience, courage, and humor. Dr. Isaacs will describe the history and contents of the archive where it can be accessed, plus play for us a few original recordings. Dr. Isaacs, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Let's begin. Uh, good morning, all of you. Thank you so much for coming in in person and streaming wherever it is you are out there. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, um, I'll begin. So in English, not in Yiddish, although I'll be reading some in Yiddish for the Yiddish impaired people here. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that contrary to what the history books tell us, World War II did not end in 1945. Certainly not for the victims and survivors. Um, because they were homeless, because they were traumatized, because they had no home to return to. Uh, some were in uh, displaced persons camps, some were in the Soviet Union, um, and there were some years. The displaced persons camps in Germany kept going until the mid-1950s, uh, to my surprise. So I want to begin with a poem by Avrom Sotskevel, uh, a survivor and a great Yiddish poet, and it's uh, Who Will Remain, What Will Remain, 
Wer wird bleiben? Was wird bleiben? Bleiben wird der Wind. Bleiben wird die Blindheit von dem Blinden, was verschwindet. Bleiben wird das Simmen von dem Jam, ein Schnierlschäum. Bleiben wird der Wolkendl, verzeppelt euch verbeugen. Wer wird bleiben? Was wird bleiben? Bleiben wird er drauf. Bereichert dick, eureuschke Rossen, wieder sein Beschaff. Bleiben wird der Fiedelreus, le Covid sich allein. Sieben Grosen von die Grosen werden sich verstehen. So he's asking this question. He, this is written during the war, but wondering what will remain of the world that he grew up in, that he lived in. And it was already clear that almost none of it would remain. And that's what happened. The war finally tapered down, the people were there, the uh, soldiers went back and had their parades and their suburbia, and there uh, we were, my parents, me, in displaced persons camp. My, <laughs> the displaced persons camp I was born in was called Leipheim, and it was right next to Ginsburg. And I just published an article in Moment Magazine recently about why Ginsburg is important because it's to this day the home of the Mengele Tractor Factory. And the Mengele family still is honored there. They have street sign honoring Karl Mengele, the father of Josef Mengele. Um, so uh, that was my birthplace. Uh, and then we, we, most of the survivors, my parents included, wanted as much as possible to get out of Europe. Europe was not a safe place to be anymore for Jews. And so the problem was that most, uh, the United States was not letting most Jews in. Um, so we wound up in these camps um, and um, trying to find a visa to get here and there. So um, I want to read something by Elie Wiesel another survivor, he came from my mother's region of Europe. And it's from an introduction to a songbook of uh, songs written in or sung in the DP camps uh, that were popular at the time, but songs sung and created during World War II. And here's what he said. So, in Cheder long ago we learned, and then Moses sang, and so Moses, our teacher, and the children of Israel, while standing by the sea, began to sing. Since that time, the Jewish song has accompanied the history of the Jewish people. Everything is said in song. Songs of joy, songs of sorrow, songs of mourning. The expression of the soul of our people is in their song. More correctly, is their songs. Jews on the way to slaughter, Slaughter chambers sang, they dreamed about redemption and sang. Rocking their children, they allowed themselves to be carried away by the magic of old new melodies. Uh, so um, the song that he's wrote this introduction for is called Song of Songs and so Psalms, Hymns and Lamentations. Anyway, um, so during, even during the war, uh, people were collecting the songs that were uh, sung and created or repurposed uh, in the camps as a kind of spiritual survival. And then when the survivors finally managed to make their way out, and in the case of the Stonehill Collection to New York City in 1948, there, was, there were individuals who started collecting these songs and publishing them and making them available. So um, the people were being temporarily housed in these like apartment hotels, not luxurious by any means. The particular one that Ben Stonehill frequented was called the Hotel Marseille and it's on, still exists, still has a lot of immigrants in it. Uh, it's on Broadway and 103rd Street and um, he, uh, he was a flooring installer. He grew up in a, a family in Rochester, New York. He was the youngest of many children, had a real love for Yiddish, Yiddish culture, was active in YIVO, and he took it upon himself as an individual um, to go to one of these apartment hotels 
and he was very innovative, so he managed to get a, a wire recording machine and recorded over nine hours worth of sound, over a thousand songs um, on the, in the summer of 1948 from survivors, men, women, children, younger, older. Most of the survivors were young, you know, I think we don't realize that now, but the Germans had killed old people. People over a certain age were immediately killed. So it was youngsters who had a chance to survive. Um, so they came to this hotel and were looking for relatives, we're going to begin to learn English, we're going to begin looking for work. And he set up his equipment and people as they walked by uh, could sit down and volunteer to sing a song. And so the, this is the body of songs. I had a fellowship, thanks to a man named Brett Werb at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, I spent uh, a year uh, c sitting uh, with uh, headphones and listening to the songs. And they were uncut, untracked songs. I sat there and created a kind of rubric for them downloaded them into mp3s. I had to learn some technology that I wasn't capable of at the time and uh, made a uh, sense out of some of the songs and uh, donated the collection to, to what my work to, uh, to create an, a website with an organization called Center for Traditional Music and Dance in New York. So you can actually listen to the sounds of the singers themselves and I translated many of the songs and, trans and transcribed them. So anyway, so this is Ben Stonehill and his two so uh, sons on the screen there. Uh, they were living in Sunnyside, Queens. Uh, he founded a Jewish school there. And um, he, he, he collected all this and then nobody wanted it. Nobody was interested. Part of the zeitgeist at the time was telling the survivors, forget about it all. You have, you're here now, start a new life. Yiddish isn't important, none of this stuff is important. You're Americans now, you know, uh, move on. And so nobody would take his collection. So he saved it in his basement in, in Queens and kept trying. And finally in 1964, he came down with terminal cancer and he knew his time was limited, so he tried again. And this time, thank goodness, a woman named Ray Corson at the Library of Congress had the wisdom, and the Folklife Center there had the wisdom to take the collection. And he personally supervised it being changed from wire reel to tape. And uh, it's been at the Library of Congress ever since. And then the Library of Congress shared it with the Holocaust Museum and a number of academic institutions. So now the, the sound archive is available with Evo as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So let me talk a little bit about the songs themselves. So let's move to the next slide, please. So I want to start with just a niggin. Uh, some of the, a niggin is a melody and it's meant to be sort of meditative and so this is one of the things that he collected. So, and there were many, many religious songs in the collection. So can we hear? So, um, you know, it's really exciting to just listen to this kind of sound archive. You know, it's 1948. I don't know who the child was or where he's living now, but it's a pretty complicated melody for a little kid to be singing, and it sort of underscores the importance of the musical tradition to Jews. Um, <coughs> the next song is, is a song that was written by a, a famous Yiddish songwriter named Mordechai Gebirtik, and he himself died in, a, in one of the camps. <coughs> but this is a song that was written before the war, 
but spoke to the victims of the war. And it's es brennt, it's burning. So it was written about a pogrom, because before World War II there was a lot of there were a lot of pogroms, and this is describing a town being burned and uh, telling the residents of the town not to just stand there, but to do something. Let me read a little bit. You have here a wonderful library at the synagogue, and one of the ones, books you have here is called Voices of a People by Ruth Rubin, who was a big collector of Yiddish songs with a whole chapter on songs of the Holocaust. And here is, is, here is the words in English. Well, in Yiddish a little bit, and then English. Es brennt, es brennt, oi unser orem shtetl nebuch brennt. It's burning, brothers, it's burning. Oh, our poor little town is aflame. Angry winds full of fury tear and break and blow asunder. Stronger still, the wild flames, everything is burning. And you stand there and look on with folded arms. And you stand there looking on while our town goes up in flames. It's burning, it's burning. Oh, the moment can, all, alas, come when our city with us in it can go up in flames, leaving it like after a battle with empty and charred walls. It's burning, it's burning. Help depends only on you. In the town, if the town is dear to you, take the vessels, quench the fire, quench it with your own blood. Show what you can do. Do not stand there looking on with folded arms. Don't stand there, brothers. Quench the fire. Our little town's aflame. So activism. Let's, let's listen. <coughs> So you can tell from oh, okay. Stay 
So you can tell from his singing that he, this is a chazan, this is somebody who knows Jewish melodies and the way he sings it is not as a straight folk song, but as a kind of religious tone to it. And yet it's a call to arms. Um, and so it was very powerful and very resident, resonant for the people who had watched their homes being destroyed and had watched their world uh, go up in flames, and it remained uh, with them. So I wanted you to hear that. And then let's move on to the next slide, please. No, 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 no. Sorry about that. It's like a duet now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, John. All right, so displaced people. So the years in the displaced persons camps were not spent idly by any means. There was a kind of subculture formed where Jews from Hungary and Romania and everywhere were kind of you know, all together um, in these temporary quarters trying to figure things out, trying to make sense of what had happened, but even more importantly, trying to reconnect with family, with friends, with people from their own towns. They started publishing in the DP camps. There were all kinds of newspapers. They were under the umbrella of a number of organizations. You know, Germany was divided up into various occupied zones. So the Americans, the British, the French had their zones. DP camps were in Austria and, and in Italy. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it was a kind of trying to figure out what next, who am I, where do I fit in, which ideology, what do I believe in. Many became Zionists and wanted to go to Israel. Um, many didn't because at that time it was under the British and then they were going to be fighting with the Arabs and they figured they had enough fighting. They weren't ready to, uh, to go to another war zone. <coughs> so uh, the picture you see here is the dining hall of the DP camp where my parents were. And my father wrote his memoirs. He told an interesting story. Apparently, the American authorities decided to hire Jewish, German women to do the cooking for us. And the, needless to say, the Jews were not happy with that. Um, you know, here were G German women getting paid to produce food that they didn't especially care for. So they had a strike, and they protested, and they marched, and they got permission for the, to do their own cooking so they would have food that they were to taste. Um, so uh, anyway, um, so that's uh, in 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 these situation they could talk with each other about what had happened and sing some of the songs and one of the songs I wanted to share with you I don't have the recording of it here because we don't have time but one is about Chotch though I have no home I have no land to live in the world drives me away but I pay them no mind I continue to live I wish I had um, I wish I had this kind of uh, I wish this kind of life upon my enemies. Uh, what a kind of taste or appearance my existence has, my life, my worth, my wandering. Yet I live. Um, though I have no feet, no hands, no part of me intact, I still want to dance wildly, so I dance. Though I have no voice left, no sound left to make, still I want to sing, so I sing. Yet I sing. So this kind of very strong survivor will to continue um, and ready to take on what's next. A kind of resilience is a popular word these days. Okay, let's move on to the next. Uh, is that the Rebetzin? I think we don't have time for the Rebetzin. It's a dirty song anyway, so. <laughs> Yeah, there were all these young guys hanging out in the hallways, and they shared all kinds of songs, including, I did a whole presentation on the off-color songs from this recording, but that's for another time. So, so let's move to... All right, so here we have the Partizano. So one of the biggest, most important writers and collectors of this time was a man named Schmelke Kaczerginski, 
and he was a partisan. And here you have the names of various collectors. So you have Ben Stonehill, but also Ruth Rubin, who did a lot of work, Hannah and Joseph Mlotek, and they just published, you have, you have access online now to the whole Mlotek song archive. So for those of you who are into Yiddish singing, um, it's all digitized now. And they're having a big party, in, I think it's in Central Park soon, with all the Yiddish singers going to be singing Yiddish songs uh, honoring the Mlotek collection. And Katja Ginsky himself, who was fought with the partisans, survived the war, came to the hotel where Stonehill was collecting and actually sang a bunch of his songs for Stonehill on the reel, and then was going off to a lecture somewhere in America and having survived the whole war died in a plane crash going to a lecture in 1954. So, had a sadly, okay, let's move on. Um, do we have, we don't have Paxichai, no. Okay, let's go on further. Paxichai, it was a fun song also because it's a, the, he tells about how the Jews in uh, Kovna were told to pack up and uh, in Vilna were told to go to uh, Belarus to pack all your things. So they knew that in Riga the Germans were planning to throw them into the sea. So they, they knew also at the same time that the Soviet troops were coming closer and soon the Germans would have to pack up their bags and take off. So that's how the song ends. Okay. Yeah. So this is a drawing from a DP camp newspaper in Bergen-Belsen called Unsere Stimme. And there was an artist named Daronsik. And here you have an image of what the survivors looked like after they came out of the camps. Many of them were still in those striped uniforms, skinny, sick. There was a huge number of medical issues, amputations. These were people who had been starved and tormented for a long time. Um, so this drawing, I think, is very evocative. And one of the songs that I, I collected is called Dort in dem Lager, and it's there in the camp, and this guy is standing around and, you know, s talking about what it looked like, um, you know, that, uh, it's like Dort in dem Lager, uh, he's standing in a work forced labor and he's told uh, to keep working but he's describing what he's seeing and that's one of the songs that's in the collection okay let's I see we're running low on time let's move a little bit more we got time oh good yeah yeah, yeah. huh it's okay it's okay can we hear Dalton them Lager? is that in there Never mind, that's okay. All right, let's, let's go to the next one. Sorry about that. Oh, Leipheim. <clears throat> so Leipheim is the camp where I was born. And there, um, my father was a DP camp policeman. The, he had, he had, my father had been in the Soviet U Union during World War II, um, was in... Uh, Kyrgyzstan, and then when he started learning about what, it, what was happening in, back in Poland and learned what happened to his family, to the, the Jews there, he, so, he joined the Soviet army and um, fought with them until Budapest and then uh, was demobilized back into the Polish army and then back to Germany. And um, so he... Uh, he shows up in Munich with a bunch of, so he and a bunch of other ex-partisans and, and soldiers were contacted by the Brecha, which is a, a Zionist um, ad hoc um, kind of a force to trying to get Jews out of Europe into Israel. And so he and 26 soldiers helped smuggle a whole lot of trainload of Jews out of Poland, out of communist Poland, to the West, to Germany. <clears throat> and so he wound up in Munich at the uh, American headquarters, still wearing his Soviet uniform. 
and carrying a gun <laughs> and with a bunch of other rough looking guys and they were terrified. But luckily one of the people there knew Yiddish and understood who these people were and very smartly gave them different kind of uniform and had them become a police force for the DPs in the camps. And so that was the camp. And then my father, who had been a Bundist before the war, kind of socialist, um, was involved in uh, trying to create something like a literary life. And so they had a publication uh, called Aheim, A Home, and uh, they made a kind of humor column for it called, instead of Leipheim, which means the home of the lion, Leidheim, which means the home of suffering. And these are some of the cartoons that they um, published in that uh, newspaper. And uh, so, and you see above here, I, uh, there's a couple of songs. I, didn't, I don't have them for you to listen to, but they're in, important. Because there was a lot of, um, whenever you have a lot of aid going out to people in trouble, often it doesn't get to the people in trouble. Often there are a lot of people in between with sticky hands. And so there was this huge black market happening in post-war Europe and a lot of people um, sort of stealing, I guess is the word. And one of the or help organizations, the Joint Distribution Committee, a lot of the people in the camps didn't really trust them. A lot of stuff got siphoned off and there was a lot of trading and like American soldiers wanting expensive German cameras and then nylon stockings going to German young women who are ready to trade for other goods. And so one of the songs that I enjoyed in this collection is called Saint Wagon in UNRWA. UNRWA is the United Nations Relief and Organization. And it's a counting song. So there are 10 wagons of goods coming to UNRWA and then nine and then eight and then seven and then six and so forth and stuff gets given here and stolen there until it finally arrives at the camp and there's nothing left. So it's a kind of uh, parody. There's another song in the collection that's very critical of Chamberlain and Hitler and Mussolini. Um, so it's a very rich collection and I encourage you to, if you, if you can, to go on the the website that has the collection, if you want to know further, it's the Center for Traditional Music and Dance, ctmd.org, and uh, under their archives. And what I did in the collection is I sorted things out by uh, thematic category. So they have songs of heroism and partisans, songs about the camps and the ghettos. What, a lot of the songs are about loss, about old age and youth, songs about homelessness, a lot of songs about lost children. That's a big issue, and you see a lot of that in Ruth Rubin's collections. Lullabies, Ch lullabies for children that were lost, but also children who lost their parents, uh, very moving and sad. A lot of religious songs, uh, a great version of Chad Gadya, um, uh, a lot of the people who survived, some of the people who survived had been in yeshivas and, and had a religious education. A lot of political songs um, and a lot of philosophizing, what it means to be a Jew. I recently had a conversation with another child of survivors about how some of the survivors' reaction to what had happened was to just say, it's too dangerous to be a Jew in the world. I'm not gonna be a Jew. I'm gonna, you know, um, I don't know, <laughs> sort of forget everything from before the war and recast myself as, as a Protestant or whatever. Um, so some people reacted that, and some people reacted totally the other way. Because they wanted me to die because I'm a Jew, I'm gonna be a Jew even more and in their face. So you had the whole gamut of emotional reactions to, to survival. Um, so, um, so that pretty much concludes what I have to say and I'll take questions and thank you all for listening. And um, <clears throat> yeah. A 
Frage von Rebbe Vrom. <laughs> okay. So in order uh, for, first, thank you very much, Dr. Isaacs. In order for the people on the live stream to hear what's going on, I'll ask the questioners to use the microphone. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, beautiful presentation, Professor Isaacs, and uh, it brought attention to many of the things that I've studied before and knew about. However, my question to you regarding the songs that were uh, transcribed, I noticed there was only one song that had actually musical notes. And were they transcribed just with the words, or were there any of those songs actually transcribed with any musical notes then or later? Good question. So yes, um, the songs were just oral at initially. It was just, it's just sound, raw sound. And then when I began working on the project, I and, and a couple of other people helped transcribe the words um, and translated the words to, and not all the songs by any means, but I'd say about 60, 70 of them, so it's a lot. And um, th the ones that were more unusual, some you know were known already in other places. And then um, I've given various presentations over time, and so a young fellow at Cornell University decided to do the notation for some of the songs. So I have those, and I can, I'm happy to share those with you, but mostly not in musical notation at all. Now, Ruth Rubin has in, her, in this book an appendix, and there's also a couple of other anthologies of songs of the Holocaust, and especially Kaczaginski songs. So those, you can find the musical notation for those. And they're wonderful songs. Wonderful songs. Yeah, I don't even, you know, I, I only scratched the surface and, and talked about some of the more unusual ones for the most part. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Isaacs. Uh, perhaps you can help me understand something from my youth. I was born in a DP camp and grew up in a Holocaust survivor community. And at times, um, survivors would come together and sing this song called Zol Shein Zayn de Gula. Zol Shein Kim and de Gula, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, they're looking for salvation. <clears throat> uh, they're Mashiach, you know. This, this, so, you know, uh, Wiesel talks about that in that in introduction. There's a kind of spiritual um, comfort in a song like that, because it's almost, I'm not a musician, but it's almost like a march. Zol shoin kim and igu, it's a really, here's you know. My, here's my confusion. <clears throat> yeah. As, as a kid, I thought there was mockery that I was hearing. No, I don't think so. Song. Now, maybe in the individual cases, maybe they were mocking, but I, I've never heard it mocked. Um, the other song that was very, common in, in, in those, and really survivors continued to stay together as a community because people around them really didn't understand. They needed each other as a kind of emotional support. They weren't getting therapy. There were no therapists for these people. They were, had PTSD. They were traumatized beyond belief. And so they needed each other as comfort. And um, so, Vuahin uh, Zolich Gain, Where Can I Go, was one of the very popular songs, because no country was letting us in. So where can we go? Who can answer? Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So did I, did I answer your question? OK. <clears throat> yes. Uh, we have, but not during the DP camps, but during the actual you know, concentration camps, was there singing? Was yes, there? yes, there was a lot of singing. You know, it's part of the culture, <clears throat> and it's a survival mechanism. Also, they were bereft of everything. They didn't have books. They didn't have much to go with. So you had, some of them were in forced labor. So there's the kind of songs you sing while you're laboring. And then there were the songs, you know, the lullabies, the um, partisan songs to give people courage, um, songs from before. Um, my mother, who was a survivor, <clears throat> uh, one of the songs she liked to sing was 
wie sind meine sieben gute Jahre? So, where are my seven good years? Now, that was a song that had been a theater song before the war. And it's a sad song about the belief, the folk belief, that everybody's entitled to seven good years in their lives. And if you haven't had seven good years, you've been cheated. And if you've had more than seven good years, you're, you're in good shape. So the song is, where are my seven good years? I haven't had them. You know, and so that kind of song was, was around too. Yeah, and also uh, loss, mothers, you know, mame, mame vi biste, mame vustiste, you know, so looking for especially close relatives that you know were killed. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so what these uh, people in 48 were singing most part were the songs that they had sung. And sometimes the songs were a form of narration, remembering what had happened. As is, as is true of songs historically over the ages, you know, you sort of tell your history. It's easier to remember if it's rhyming and has meter. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, does the Yiddish Book Center, you mentioned that uh, a different repository for the songs. Right. Uh, and does the, uh, you have any relationship with the Yiddish Book Center? I've had a long relationship with the Yiddish Book Center. I don't think I've ever lectured there, but I've been there, and I've done research a little bit there. Not much, mind you. But um, actually, last summer I was there and led a singing session with a whole bunch of their Steiner students. And we sat around, it was a thunderstorm that night. And we sat outside under tents with little flashlights and sang Yiddish songs in the storm. It was quite, quite beautiful. And yeah, so they do a lot, um, yeah. Actually, I've had two fellowships with them, what am I saying? One was to uh, translate the poems of Rachel Korn, who was wonderful poets, uh, and I translated her wartime poems, and then they, I had a fellowship with them to translate the memoir of Shimon Jigan, a Yiddish comedian. So, and I've just found a publisher for that, so I'm excited, yeah. Because I know, I've, when I've been there, they have, um, they have film. They yeah, they made a film about Sutskevel, the, the uh, poet that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, yeah, Krista Whitney made a wonderful <laughs> movie about him and also Bela Schechter Gottesmann. They do so much, really. It's impressive. And they have this online archive of Yiddish literature. And they've recently partnered up with the Montreal Jewish Library with their sound archives. <clears throat> so. You know, we, Jews are, we like to preserve everything. We don't like to let anything go. We're very anal. And so, <clears throat> so this is part of our story and part of our tradition and part of our history. And thank goodness, you know, between YIVO and the Yiddish Book Center and the Israeli National Library and the Jewish public, in the New York City Public Library, we have a lot to turn to and the Holocaust Museum, of course. <clears throat> about history, preserving history. It's very interesting uh, that the Hebrew word to go forward, Kadima, comes from the same root as Mikedem, from the past. Ah. Because in order to be able to go forward, you have to first of all go in the past and understand it, and only then can you properly go forward. And it's interesting, the first, the same root of kuf dalad mem, of the Hebrew word kedem, kadima, is the same root as backward, mi kedem, from the days of old. That's so interesting and so important. And it's also a wine. Let me ask a question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that you had translated and transcribed something like 70 or 80 songs. Yeah. Um, and there were originally 1,000. So my question is, how, how is this archive being used today? Or Do you know, are there scholars working on it today to translate additional or transcribe additional songs? Or just I know that uh, Pete Ruszewski, who, who runs the Center for Traditional Music and Dance, he got some help, some interns 
to because it's very time consuming work, you know, and I devoted a lot of time to it. Um, and so he did get a, some funding, and then all of a sudden this COVID thing happened, and that kind of slowed things down. I don't know that I, I should check with um, Brett Werb at the Holocaust Museum, but there there is a, a sizable body of um, of material already, and then Anna Sternschis and. Soy Korolenko in Toronto have done a whole lot with Holocaust music and are still active. So I think they're, they're probably the most active at this point. They travel all over Europe and give concerts. I don't have that much energy, but they, they do, so, yeah. Uh, and any other questions? Okay. Well, uh, uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Isaacs for a very, very interesting presentation. <laughs>